It's critically important that I think as Catholics, we educate ourselves on all the issues and all the candidates. As the midterm elections near, a newly released EWTN Real Clear Politics poll gives us important insights into the Catholic vote. We break down the numbers for a look ahead at issues of great importance to the faithful. Student volunteers on the ground in Kansas, door knocking in support of the Value Them Both Amendment. We talk to two young ladies from the pro-life generation about their important mission. They become afraid of their trafficker because of the massive abuse and the threatening and blackmail. The troubling world of human trafficking, what one determined religious sister is doing to help stop human slavery, an EWTN News in-depth special report. And into the cloistered life of Carmelite nuns, we venture behind the scenes at one of our country's oldest monasteries. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. This is ultimately about the ability of Kansas to preserve uh, reasonable restrictions and regulations of abortion services that are already on the books, and then to have a thoughtful democratic conversation about what the right policy ought to be for our state. Voters in Kansas are weeks away from deciding the nation's first statewide ballot initiative since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. It's an attempt to counter a state Supreme Court decision that recognized abortion as a fundamental right. Welcome to EWTN News In-Depth. Political battle lines are drawn for many Americans as abortion law shifts to the states. Key votes are coming up in statewide primaries as we head towards this fall's midterm elections. How does faith affect the ballot box? What's the mood among Catholic voters? EWTN teamed up with Real Clear Politics to poll more than 1,700 Catholics about their views. Our poll shows American Catholics are almost evenly divided, with 42% considering themselves Democrat and 38% Republican. Some 20% describe themselves as independent or unaffiliated. However, on political issues, 40% said they lean conservative and 34% lean more liberal, 26% are moderate. And those conservative Catholic voters could have a big influence this fall. Of special interest are governor's races across the country. Who's in charge in the governor's mansion will impact how states weigh in on many issues, including abortion, now that the U.S. Supreme Court has returned the regulation of abortion to the states. Mark Irons begins our political coverage. We're standing in common cause for our freedom. It's still summer, but the bombardment of political ads begins. State politics heating up across America. This November, these 36 states will elect their next leader, a governor who could authorize or block the passage of consequential laws. For Catholics, the gubernatorial elections offer another chance to examine the candidates and issues at stake in their own state. In Pennsylvania, Democrat Josh Shapiro squares off against Republican Doug Mastriano. It's an incredibly important race. Eric Failing is executive director of the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. It's the public relations branch of the Catholic Church in Pennsylvania. Each state has something similar. Not there to endorse candidates, but to encourage voters. It's critically important that I think as Catholics, we educate ourselves on all the issues and all the candidates, um, what they're saying, what they've done in the past, um, and, and really try to discern prayerfully, thoughtfully, um, which ones coincide with our, our beliefs the most. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops provides further guidance. In their teaching document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, the bishops remind Catholics our participation in political parties or other groups to which we may belong should be influenced by our faith, not the other way around. Voters may hear from gubernatorial candidates who are self-proclaimed Catholics like Ohio Governor Mike DeWine or New York Governor Kathy Hochul. But that doesn't guarantee their politics are influenced by their faith. For example, Governor Hochul is a vocal advocate of abortion. The bishops have highlighted issues for Catholics to pay attention to. Informing consciences for faithful citizenship, the bishops write, the threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself. The bishops say they cannot dismiss or ignore other serious threats to human life and dignity, such as racism, the environmental crisis, poverty, and the death penalty. Failing adds even more issues the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference is focusing on. School choice, obviously a big issue for us. Um, criminal justice reform, big issue for us. <laughs> 
And what happens next with the reversal of Roe versus Wade at the Supreme Court? Individual states now have the right to legislate on abortion, meaning the governor's races take on even more significance. And these races become even more interesting in states like this one. Here in Pennsylvania, the majority party inside the legislature is opposite the governor's party. That has meant pro-life bills successfully passed by state lawmakers were ultimately rejected, vetoed by the current Pennsylvania governor, abortion supporter and Democrat Tom Wolf. Wolf won't be on the ballot this fall, but his hopeful Democratic successor, Josh Shapiro, supports abortion. Pro-lifers have to be ready to defend our pro-life candidates in the election this year. Carol Tobias, president of the National Right to Life Committee, expects the battle over abortion to intensify. I think this year's elections are going to be the most contentious we have seen possibly ever. Even Catholics divide themselves over the issues. According to a new EWTN Real Clear Opinion research poll of Catholic likely voters, 53% are less likely to support political candidates who support taxpayer funding of abortion in the U.S. 35% are more likely to. 50% are more likely to support candidates who support the death penalty, while 36% are less likely to. And though 63% of Catholics polled say gender is created by God, 25% say people can determine their own gender. According to a Gallup poll, about 22.5% of American adults are Catholic. Though they don't always agree, their votes will have an impact on the governor's races across America. Eric Failing hopes all Catholics will educate themselves about church teaching, spend time in prayer, and vote with a well-formed conscience. It's critical. Pray. Right? Um, spend some time in silence. Get away from the noise. He says it's not about being Republican or Democrat, but Catholic. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. The religious vote could be critical in an upcoming election in early August. That's when the citizens of Kansas go to the polls to decide on an amendment called Value Them Both, designed to change the state's constitution and liberal policies towards abortion. As we said, it's the first big ballot test in America since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Dozens of college students from around the state outdoor knocking in support of the Value Them Both amendment. The important vote is just weeks away on August 2nd. The Value Them Both constitutional amendment tries to counter a 2019 Kansas Supreme Court decision which recognized abortion as a fundamental right. In 2019, an act of the state court radically changed the constitution of the state of Kansas, making it impossible to regulate abortion in even the simplest of ways. And now our state, unlike all of the surrounding states, um, we have no way to place any kind of reasonable limits on the abortion industry. It's made Kansas one of the most liberal states in the country on abortion, an abortion access state in the middle of the country surrounded by states with strict limits on abortion and a battleground state for both pro-life and pro-abortion advocacy groups. The divide is reflected in the race for Kansas governor. Incumbent Democratic Governor Laura Kelly recently said, I will continue to oppose all regressive legislation which interferes with individual rights or freedoms and threatens the economic strides we've made in recent years, making Kansas a welcoming place to do business. But one of her Republican challengers, current Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt, says the Kansas Supreme Court got it wrong. When our court found a right to access abortion, uh, that is actually a, a higher level right in terms of legal protection than what Roe versus Wade has afforded in the federal system. Um, they committed error that I think only the people of Kansas can correct. But what's at stake here is both the integrity of our state constitution and then of course obviously the ability of Kansans at the ballot box and through their elected officials to decide what the proper state policy in terms of access to abortion should be. In Topeka, the Kansas State House of Representatives and Senate passed the Value Them Both Amendment in January with a two-thirds vote, putting it on the August 2nd ballot for voters to decide. And since February, pro-life volunteers have been training and then walking neighborhoods to educate voters about the Kansas Supreme Court ruling and the amendment, which would reverse it and enable state lawmakers to pass legislation regulating abortion. Many are college students from schools across Kansas, including Benedictine College, Kansas State, and Emporia State. They're working in teams out of field offices, covering all 105 Kansas counties. The Catholic Church here says that a yes vote is critical to the defense of the life and dignity of both women and children, and not only for the state of Kansas. I think it's going to be the first 
test in any state of, uh, of what the voters really believe. And so I think, I think the eyes of the nation will really be upon Kansas in this, and it, it will affect other states. What's it like there knocking on doors for the Value Them Both campaign? We're joined by two Kansas students who have been doing just that. Hannah Jager and Mara Lofman recently graduated from Catholic high schools where they both were leaders in their school's pro-life groups. This fall, Hannah and Mara will both be attending Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. Hannah and Mara, welcome to our show. A question for both of you. What motivated you to join the local movement to educate Kansas voters about the Value Them Both amendment, Hannah? Um, yeah, so I've been pro-life my entire life, and it's really important to me to not only be pro-life, but to do something about it. So something amazing is being able to door knock or make phone calls and as well as prayer, which is the most important. But, yeah. And Mara, what about you? Well, I think it's really important for our generation who's able to, to get out and door knock for the older generation who can't quite do it. And they always thank us for the work that we do while they do the behind the scenes work for us. It's important. What was your reaction when you heard the news of the Supreme Court decision just a couple of weeks ago? Um, a lot of emotions. I was actually at a coffee shop with my friend and I got the news and I just kind of started like laughing and like joy, um, just really exciting. Yeah, and I was at physical therapy actually that morning and I was like trying to hold my excitement in because I didn't really know what company I was in that morning. So it was really <laughs> nice to go to work and have so much joy around me. That's important. What's at stake then for you, knowing that Kansas will be the first state to vote on a ballot initiative since the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just having the rest of the country watching us is it's a lot of pressure and it's, it's intense, but um, it's very important for us um, as Kansans to get out there and vote, especially pro-lifers to get out there and vote yes for this amendment. Yeah. And Mara, is this your first time voting? I, is this particularly special for you because of that? Yes, it is my first time voting. And I think it's really important for the young generation to take advantage of the right that we have to vote and to have a voice in our country and really take advantage of that freedom and liberty that we have. And Hannah, how do your friends or peers feel about your involvement in this campaign? I know that Mara mentioned she wasn't sure what kind of company she was in in physical therapy. How does that feel for you? Yeah, so um, a lot of my close friends are in support of me doing this. And I do have some friends who have differing beliefs, but they've been very respectful about it. Um, it's just very important to be open to listening to each other's different opinions. And do you feel, Mara, in any way like you're called to be doing this, to speak out and to, and to talk a little bit more openly about what you believe? Um, I really think I do. I think God put me on this path and took different opportunities out of my way so that this was the line that I was on to really get my voice out there for those who don't quite have the opportunity to be as outspoken as we are. Is there a particular experience from door knocking that really marked you or has marked you so far as you go on this path, trying to convince people, both informing them of what happened with the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court decision, and then also telling them about this amendment and why it's important? Is there a story that means something to both of you? Um, yeah, um, I remember early on when I was about a weekend into this job, I encountered this woman um, who had, was not familiar with this amendment. And I was explaining it to her and she explained to me how she was pro-choice, uh, mainly for the reason if she believed that women have a right um, to abortion. I was explaining this amendment and how it does not um, ban abortion. And um, she was very respectful and she listened and she was like, you know what, I agree with the existing limits of um, in the Kansas constitution. And so she decided to vote yes. Um, whereas before I was talking to her, she was already set on voting no. So it was really cool kind of um, seeing a change in her um, to be voting yes for this amendment. And I met a really heart-taking woman who um, she was pregnant at 17 before Roe v. Wade had happened. And so she had to have her child and her child was celebrating his 55th birthday. And she was more than thankful to have the opportunity to have this child and to be able to celebrate that birthday with him. That's beautiful. Has that changed or maybe bolstered your resolve in having these conversations with people? I think it really gives us like a push when we have those nice encounters to have the fuel to have people who kind of like push us back, but also to know that like we are making a difference and that like people see us. And what kind of resistance are you getting? Um, 
there has been many different kind of encounters. Um, some of the resistance, some people are just like, I'm not interested. Um, I've had some people yell at me and you just kind of got to keep positive and keep on moving because of course you'll have those interactions. This is a very heated topic. Um, but yeah, just keeping positive and like Mara was saying, having those positive interactions are really uplifting during those times. And Mara, what do you think is needed from your local political leaders to get this over the line? Are they doing enough or just leaving all the work to you? So I think them putting it on the people's ballot is the role that they had. And I think it is now in the hands of us Kansas residents to really see how much we are gonna push this pro-life movement forward and how powerful and on the gas pedal we're gonna be these next couple of weeks. Hannah, do you think you have the momentum to get this over the line? Yes, I do. Um, we've been working really hard for this. Um, there's been a lot of support and prayers coming in and I'm really confident that this amendment will pass. A personal question for both of you, just to wrap up, do either you have aspirations to run for office or just to get more engaged in politics after this one experience? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I personally do not think I will be in the politics, but um, I will be doing whatever I can as a Kansas resident um, to be voting pro-life and to be upholding our constitution. And you, Mara? Uh, same, same, I don't think I'll ever really get in the political aspect again, but I think volunteering will definitely be something that I will do anytime this issue comes into place. So I think that's important for us. Well, thank you both. You're definitely great ambassadors for the pro-life generation. We appreciate you being on. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. The ever-changing legal landscape over abortion continues in court battles in several states. On Thursday, the Texas Attorney General asked the federal court to block an existing law called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which requires patients receive appropriate medical care, including abortion, in cases where a patient's life is at risk. Republican Ken Paxton argued federal law does not confer a right to abortion. The lawsuit comes after the Department of Health and Human Services sent a memo to state medical officials reminding them hospitals and physicians are required to provide abortions if a pregnant woman's life is in danger, even in states with near total bans. All this as Congress continues to try to pass federal laws legalizing abortion. This week, the House scheduled a vote on an updated version of the Women's Health Protection Act, which codifies the right to an abortion. It does not have enough votes to pass the Senate, which this week blocked another bill that would have protected interstate travel for women seeking abortions where they are legal. Senate Republicans denounced what they called abortion tourism. And next, we dig deeper into the new EWTN Real Clear Politics polling, more about the critical Catholic vote in this year's midterm elections, and interesting findings about how fellow Catholics are leading their faith lives. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. I woke up in the morning and I couldn't see myself this way. I said, I cannot be this person. I, I cannot believe it. I don't feel like myself. And coming up, an eye-opening special report about human trafficking, which affects nearly 40 million people around the globe. What one Catholic nun is doing to bring awareness to the scourge of human slavery. Carmelite spirituality is, I think, something that the world badly needs today. And later, life inside America's first monastery for religious women. We go to St. Carmel Monastery as we observe the feast day of Our Lady of Carmel. life going to mass as Catholics were called to actively practice our faith. But a new poll by EWTN and Real Clear Politics shows that's not always a top priority for many Catholics. And faith doesn't necessarily guide their voting decisions either. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. Carl Cannon, the Washington DC Bureau Chief of Real Clear Politics and Dr. Matthew Bunsen, the Executive Editor of EWTN News and Washington DC Bureau Chief, join me now to go more in depth on the results of our new poll and what the numbers show us about Catholic thought and Catholics voting right now in America. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us. Carl, before we dig into the specifics, what did this poll tell you about the so-called Catholic vote? It seems Catholic voters are just as divided as the rest of the country. Does the Catholic vote even still exist? Well, Catholics vote. It's not a monolithic vote, but Catholics vote, it's gonna be anywhere between one-fifth and one-fourth of the entire electorate. And um, and the, to put it as bluntly as I can, Democrats need a slight edge among Catholic voters. They've, they got that in 2020. 
Joe Biden won. You know, these things aren't exact, but but we, we think best we can tell he got about 53 percent of the Catholic vote um, against Donald Trump in 2020. And right now in this new in our poll, uh, he's it's the, the numbers are reversed. It was 53, 47 before. Now it's um, 53 percent of Catholics disapprove of Joe Biden's job as president and only 47 up approve. And that, you know, so that's that's just a switch. And the other thing that I found significant is on the generic vote. You ask people, who you, are you to, not by their congressperson by name, but are you going to vote for the Democrat uh, for Congress or Republican? And that includes Senate, House. Um, Catholic voters are split almost evenly. Slight edge to Republicans. I think it's 44, 43 with 13 percent undecided. But again, Democrats need a little edge there. And I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to say that those 13 percent undecided voter, uh, undecided Catholic voters will probably determine the outcome of the 2022 midterms. And with it, uh, who controls Congress, Republicans or Democrats? So one more time, you're going to be catering to Catholics in, in voting outreach. Matthew, what does the Catholic Church say about voting? Is it a duty for Catholics or encouraged in some way for us? Well, one of the best places to start in answering that question is to go all the way back to the middle of the second century and a fairly obscure document called the Letter to Diognetus. And in it, uh, he's defending Christianity against the Roman Empire. And he makes the note that it is the obligation of Christians to be good citizens of the empire. We, we can see throughout the whole of the remaining 2,000 years of church history, basically, that Catholics are called to be good and faithful citizens. We see that mentioned very specifically in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that uh, Catholics are to participate in political life, the betterment of society, Society to work for the common good, and part of that is what's described in many ways as a moral obligation to vote. Uh, the U.S. bishops reiterated that as well, as did the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, with its document, Participation in Political Life by Catholics. So there is that obligation to participate, uh, but then there's also the, the call that the Church always makes to discernment. Are you forming your conscience properly uh, before you vote? And that's where it gets very complicated. And that's where I think a poll like this is important as we're trying to understand where Catholics stand and how well formed they are as they make up their minds in preparation to vote. And whether they bring their full selves with them to the ballot box. Carl, the Real Clear poll indicates that 78% of voters do not consider their political party when they vote for a congressional leader. Is that a common trend? Party affiliation is important for primaries, but what does it really mean on the general election day in November? Well, it depends. You know, we have this Roman Catholics big group, but when you when you drill down, the more um, people, the more pious people are. This is true somewhat of Protestants too. The more often they go to mass, the more often they say the rosary, the more often they pray, um, the more likely they are to vote Republican. This has been a trend that's emerged in the last two generations. It, it wasn't true when John F. Kennedy ran for president. He's the first Roman Catholic president. 80% uh, of Catholics voted for Kennedy, whatever their politics. And the big issue that year in the campaign was whether John F. Kennedy would, you know, vote his conscience, vote the country, be a Democrat or be or be a Catholic first. And Kennedy assured people that Catholics were just like everybody else. They, that's one of the things that informs their, their decision making. Um, we've made great progress in a sense. You don't you don't hear a lot, or if any, anti-Catholic bias against President Biden. Um, he's Joe Biden's the second Catholic president. But, but what you do see is this dichotomy: the more people, the more people are committed to the, the, the Catholic Church, the more active they are in the church, and the more active they are, and the more um, I don't want to use the word conservative because that's not right, but the more loyal they are to the teachings of the church, the more that they incorporate those teachings into their everyday lives, the more likely they are in recent elections to vote Republican. And that an understanding of history and tradition is a part of their lives. Matthew, just 20 percent of Catholics answered that they accept all of the church's teachings, and that's reflected in how they live their life. And 35 percent accept most church teaching, and 27 percent do not accept some of the key teachings of the church. How does that impact voting on issues important to the church? Yeah, well, Carl was just making a very important point, and, and you're hitting on it uh, bluntly here, and that is uh, 
what we find that there are two real determiners of uh, how a Catholic is likely to vote. The, the one that you've just mentioned, uh, how much of the teachings of the church, how many of the teachings of the church did they embrace and act on in their lives and make part of their lives. The other is how often they attend mass. What we're finding is that there is a wide gulf uh, between those who accept the teachings of the church and those who don't and how they tend to vote. Uh, we can see that very clearly on issues like abortion, on transgender ideology, and elsewhere. Uh, so those, again, are, are key for us uh, in any polling, and we're going to look very closely at that. One thing that's worth noting, however, and this goes back to the very first question uh, that we wanted to address in this poll, is where Joe Biden stands with Catholics. And, and one thing that's notable in this is that Joe Biden is underwater. He has a higher unfavorable rating with all groups of Catholics, so whether they accept the teachings of the church or whether they don't, whether they go to mass a lot or they don't. Uh, Joe Biden is uh, facing real problems with every cohort uh, among Catholics today. It's important. And another hot issue that he's dealing with is immigration. Carl, a plurality of Americans expressed dissatisfaction with the immigration process in February. And in this poll, they're divided over support of expanding legal immigration to the U.S., with 49 percent saying that they're more likely to support immigration expansion. Does that track with the general sentiment in the country on immigration? Yes, it does. On, on immigration and some other key issues, um, Catholic voters are either either conform to the majority or 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 trendsetters or early sort of you, you see where the Catholic votes going. You see where some of these issues are going. Um, uh, Latino voters in this country, uh, Catholic Latinos, are more supportive of Joe Biden than Anglo uh, let, than Anglo Catholics. But the support is slipping even there, and you saw this in an election, uh, two elections in Texas um, mm -hmm. that took one a primary earlier this year in which the last pro-life Democrat in Congress withstood a challenge, very narrowly, but withstood a challenge um, by a, a pro-choice Democrat in the primary and a special election that went to a Republican uh, who's born in Mexico. And Mayra Flores. A, there you go. And she's a, a very devout person. And, and, you know, and some of these cultural issues We've learned in other polls that what what most voters want, Catholic and non-Catholic, is for the administration to really address inflation and to deal with this the, the, pro, the structural problems of this economy, which have gotten really bad in the last two years. And we will keep looking at these results over the next coming weeks. And I know EWTN uh, News Nightly will be covering that as well. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Good to be with you. Next, we turn our attention to a disturbing issue. We go in depth on the tragedy of human slavery. To hear that a human being has been so treated like a dog, like meat on the market, is just incredible. Colin Flynn's special report will meet a warrior fighting back against human trafficking. The battle Sister Imelda Poole is waging against pure evil every single day. EWTN News In Depth is coming right back. turn now to a difficult topic the Catholic Church has been very vocal about, the scourge of human trafficking. People taken advantage of, sold for labor, for organ harvesting, for the sex trade. Their leaders within the Catholic Church were doing incredible work around the globe to combat this evil. In a special report, EWTN News In-Depth correspondent Colin Flynn introduces us to one such person, a religious sister whose life is dedicated to the fight. A warning. This report is candid and disturbing. I was living in a neighborhood, and one night, two guys I knew took me out for a coffee. They told me one of their friends had a car, and they invited me along. This is a 17-year-old girl who is recounting her experience of being trafficked when she was just 16. I thought they were my friends, but it was just a lie, a trick. They started giving me alcohol and then drugs. I would stay with them in a house. Then more guys started appearing. 
And did you have any idea what was going on or was it a case that because they were giving you alcohol and drugs you didn't, you would wake up maybe the next day or not know what had happened or what exactly they were doing? I woke up in the morning and I couldn't see myself this way. I said, I cannot be this person. I, I cannot believe it. I don't feel like myself. This is not possible. What kind of threats would they make towards you if you would leave or tell people what was happening? Uh, they told me things like, I will come to your house and I will kill you. They also told me they had recorded videos of me. They said, we will post them on the internet and ruin you. I was destroyed. Psychologically, physically. In every aspect. The number of trafficked people in the world is increasing. Figures from the United Nations estimate that there are around 40.3 million people trafficked in the world today. They're trafficked for labor, marriages, babies, organs and sex. Very few are detected and rescued, only around 1%. And it's in poorer countries like Albania in Southeast Europe that many girls and young women are tricked into leaving their homes after they meet a boy who promises them a better life abroad. They are wooed with presents and a better life, a job in Italy maybe, and I'll, let's get married and let's go together and let's make a better life. So this is a long-term project, so a boy would pretend to maybe be for a year, in love with the girl, Absolutely. gain the trust of the family. Mm. Do you think she's a part of a ring of, of traffickers in Albania? Sister Imelda Pool is a religious sister. Her order of nuns, Mary Ward Loretto, work to rescue and rehabilitate victims of human trafficking. To hear that a human being has been so treated like a dog, like meat on the market, is just incredible in civilization today. You know, when we know better. But unfortunately, um, there's a cold heart around in the world. The problem of trafficking is rooted in poverty. And Sister Imelda is bringing me to visit the home of a young woman called Aurora, who lives with her grandmother and her niece in a small town. They have very little. She earns around 250 euros a month. And she recalls to me a time when strange men followed her sister outside of school. They followed her and took pictures of her. They wouldn't leave her alone. They suspect that they were traffickers, looking for their next victim. These stories have become all too familiar for Sister Imelda, who has been working in Albania with trafficked victims for 16 years. What are the, the methods that the traffickers have for keeping them in their hold? One of them is that they, are fri they become afraid of their trafficker because of the massive abuse and the threatening and blackmail that they will be found, that there is nowhere where they cannot be found. They beat them, they also drag them. It's very, very common for, especially somebody that's been trafficked for sex, that they will straight away rape them and drag them. So their kind of competence for good decision making is weakened. Sister Imelda is having a meeting with representatives of other organizations that also work with trafficked victims. Some help them with housing, others education and so on. They are all closely linked and work together to care for the victims as best they can. If we start with a prayer, it helps us to be closer with uh, uh, the victims of human trafficking that we support. And Something that comes up in the meeting is one of the major obstacles to young women being reunited with their families after they've been trafficked. And that is the stigmas and shame that surround a trafficked girl. One of the organization leaders tells a story of a family she knows, 
where a man told his brother not to accept his daughter back into the home because she had been trafficked. Uh, brother will not talk to him, not only his brother, but the whole relatives will not talk to, this, to the father of this girl. That's why it's very difficult. To better understand the honour system in certain Albanian families, I've come back to a rural village and I'm sitting down with Anna Staki, who is the CEO of the Mary Ward Loretto Foundation. We have in these areas a very strong sense of honour and the honour it's usually um, related to the purity. She has to go virgin to, um, to her husband. In these families um, or in these areas, honour it's, it's the more important thing, the most important thing. So they are poor, they might have nothing, but at least they have the honour. And she knows that. And it's very hard because that, that is used also for their continuous manipulation or coercion into exploitation because she doesn't have anywhere to go now. It's so sad, isn't it, that for most of these girls, they can't go back to their families, the ones they probably need the most. Yeah, it's, it's never an option. Traffickers can be broadly separated into three groups. There are the international gangs, large, powerful and well-connected. Then there are the local gangs working in the rural areas and low-income parts of the city. And over the course of the pandemic, more victims are now being sold online on the dark web. The sophistication of the traffickers is getting more intelligent. The gangs of traffickers are getting stronger. Because they get more money from human trafficking than drug trafficking, they would have been the leaders in the drug, tra drug trafficking and also um, weapon trafficking. And why is that? Because nowadays, with uh, more sophisticated detection equipment and processes, oh, yes. it's harder to traffic narcotics and mm. weaponry, but maybe easier to traffic human beings. Well, I think it's to do with greed and the money. You can sell a gun once and it's gone. But a human being, you sell over and over and over again, and you get a lot more money. And then there are the individual traffickers, who can even sometimes be family members, prostituting their very own children. Sister Melda has come across a number of these cases. But the woman that you met, is the justification for just the, the dire poverty? And yes, it is. It's, it's means to an end? Yes, it's a means to an end. It's like the mother selling the baby, you know, for sex trafficking, the child, little child. You know, how could a mother do that? But the excuse or the argument will be, I'm feeding four other children. This one will suffer, but I'm feeding four other children. It's a vicious cycle. Dire poverty and hunger can make moral lines become more blurred, and then the victims become numb to the pain. It's a kind of almost automatic pilot, like a defense mechanism, but the trauma that that leads to when they disassociate leads to a much longer recovery period. In another part of the capital, Tirana, there is what's known as a social club for young women who have recently been rescued from trafficking. And today, there are around 10, roughly aged between 16 and 20 years old. One has a swollen black eye, but they're all smiling because for them, the main part of the nightmare is now over. I am Natasha. I am from a long tour. Now I am married and I have a child. I would like to say to all the girls who might experience something similar, to have the courage to speak up. So a message to girls all over the world is that everything that has happened is in the past. The first time you experience abuse, report it. Actually, there's, there's always tears in, in um, a person's life that works in this and I'm sorry and many do make a life you know so it's a, it's a it's a journey of a year two years three years or more depending on the trauma that the person's experienced but you can live in hope for these young people mm.
And for Sister Imelda and the others at Mary Ward Loretto, that hope is that someday they live in a world in which there's no longer a need for organizations like theirs. What is your dream, your dream for the trafficked person? Oh, my, my dream for a trafficked person is that they find joy and peace in their heart. Whatever they lead to do in their lives, that they find that. And that they feel that they have a purpose in life and they have dignity and respect. My dream is to complete my studies and go on to have a job and be able to help myself and to put behind me everything in the past. This is my dream. A message to girls out there, keep smiling and don't let anyone hold you back from your goals. In Albania, Colum Flynn, EWTN News, in depth. To find out more about Sister Imelda's mission to combat human slavery, go to her organization's website, marywardloretto.net. And our thanks to EWTN News in-depth correspondent Colin Flynn for his sensitive treatment of such a difficult subject matter. A spotlight on some other women leaders in the announcement this week of historic appointments at the Vatican. For the first time ever, women now hold seats in the office that nominates Catholic bishops. Pope Francis named three women to the dicastery for bishops, including Sister Rafaela Petrini, a Franciscan who has been the Secretary General of the Vatican's Governorate, the second highest ranking position in the government of the Vatican City State. Sister Yvonne Rengot, a Superior General of the Daughters of Mary Help of Christians, a branch of the Salatians. And one layperson, Dr. Maria Liad Zervino, a President of the World Union of Catholic Women's Organizations. The members of the dicastery assist in choosing bishops for the diocese. The ultimate decision still rests with the Pope. Up next on EWTN News In Depth, top headlines in the Week in Review. News about U.S. inflation surging to a new four-decade high in June tops our Week in Review. Americans are feeling a big financial pinch. On Wednesday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that consumer prices rose 9.1 percent last month in a year-over-year -year comparison. That's the highest rate since 1981. Nearly half of the increase is due to higher energy costs, including electricity prices up 13.7 percent, natural gas prices jumping 38.4 percent, and of course, prices at the pump are higher, more than $5 a gallon in some areas of the U.S. according to AAA. Rental and food prices also jumped. Household budgets are squeezed as the cost of many goods and services are rising faster than average incomes. Lower income and black and Hispanic Americans are being hit especially hard. The Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates aggressively, which also increases the risk of a recession. The price of oil and gas are on President Joe Biden's mind as he completes a diplomatic visit to the Middle East. On Friday, he touched down in Saudi Arabia to attend an energy summit with leaders of the Gulf states. His goal? To reduce prices at the gas pumps for U.S. consumers. In exchange for a drop in fuel prices, the Gulf nations want the U.S. to deter the Iranians from acquiring nuclear weapons and to halt their terrorist activities in the region. The visit is being closely watched because during the presidential campaign in 2020, Mr. Biden vowed to make Saudi Arabia a pariah nation. Tension is high over Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's alleged involvement in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. But much rests on the U.S. having a successful meeting. Your visit to Saudi Arabia is important for Israel and for the entire region, for our security and for the future and prosperity of the Middle East. We send with you to all the nations of the region, including, of course, the Palestinians, a message of peace. The president began his trip to the Middle East in Israel, where he met with the country's interim prime minister. They signed a joint declaration emphasizing military cooperation between the two nations and a pledge from the U.S. to use its power to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. 
Biden also visited the West Bank for talks with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. In the town of Bethlehem, the president pledged more than $300 million in new funding to support hospitals, ease food shortages, and speed up technology upgrades. While appreciative of that, Abbas expressed disappointment over America's inability to restart Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. A new wave of anger and calls for accountability in Uvalde, Texas, after surveillance video published Tuesday shows the alarmingly slow law enforcement response in stopping the shooter. The disturbing video published by the Austin American Statesman newspaper shows the gunman entering the school moments after firing his rifle outside and after several 911 calls were made. He opens the unlocked door and walks unhindered into a classroom before opening fire for more than two minutes. The 80-minute recording confirms what has been known for weeks now about one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history, that heavily armed police officers, some armed with rifles and bulletproof shields, milled about in the hallway and waited more than an hour before going into the classroom to stop the massacre on May 24th. Some at a Uvalde City Council meeting are demanding consequences for police. But what I have seen, and I've seen this on the news, where these guys, all these officers, they got their shield, they got their weapons, they got all their protective gear on, standing there, standing there. Anybody see them do a good job? Just because they tried to go in there, was that good enough? Was that good enough for the people that were bleeding out? That wasn't good enough. Nineteen children and two teachers were killed in the shooting at Robb Elementary School. The Buffalo, New York supermarket where a gunman killed 10 black people reopened to the public Friday, two months after the attack. A memorial to the victims is built inside the store. The decision to reopen rather than relocate was met with mixed emotions. But the Topps Market remains the only grocery store providing access to fresh food in the immediate area, and the neighborhood fought for years to get it built. Investigators say the shooter was motivated by white supremacist beliefs. On Thursday, he was indicted on 27 counts of federal hate crimes and firearms offenses. As Japan mourns the death of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, authorities reveal the assassin's motive may have been a grudge involving religion. Thousands of Japanese laid flowers and said prayers this week as they paid their respects at the site where a gunman ambushed Abe from behind as he was making a speech last Friday. A private funeral ceremony was held on Tuesday in Tokyo. A hearse carrying his remains drove through the streets lined with mourners, still in shock by an assassination in a nation with strict gun control. Police confiscated the suspect's homemade gun along with other improvised devices. Japanese media reported the suspect allegedly held a grudge against the Unification Church, to which his mother had donated a large sum of money, leading to the family's financial ruin. They say the gunman blamed Abe and former political leaders in his family for supporting the Unification Church's growth in Japan. Food for the human spirit that can feed our souls. That's how the director of the Vatican Observatory describes the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Brother Guy Consomagno says the science shows the logic of the universe and the pictures reveal the beauty of God's creation. NASA released the breathtaking images this week, saying they're the most comprehensive look at the universe ever. Scientists call it the dawn of a new era in astronomy as the telescope peers deeper into space than ever before. The mission, originally expected to last for 10 years, has enough excess fuel cap capability to operate for 20, allowing the Webb telescope's infrared cameras to look at that much longer into the heavens. It's a deep down happiness when you're doing God's will, then you're free. You don't have to be in the cloister to be free. But for us, that's our calling. Joy in a life of prayer and devotion. We reveal what life is like for the cloistered nuns at one of America's most historic monasteries. We are back in a moment. Finally today, this weekend marks the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, a time of prayer and devotion to our Blessed Mother. During this time of reflection, we give thanks for the many blessings bestowed upon us by Our Lady. What a perfect opportunity for us to take you, our viewers, on a virtual retreat to Mount Carmel Monastery in Southern Maryland to visit the Carmelite sisters there who dedicate their cloistered lives to prayer. Once again, here's EWTN News in-depth reporter Mark Irons.
It's not your typical nine to five, but for Bill Hoxie, it's another day at the office. He works at a Catholic monastery. Here, cloistered nuns pray behind iron gates inside a walled off property on a plot of land in Southern Maryland. Bill takes care of the grounds and serves as the nun's carpenter. He grew up Protestant and never thought he'd end up here. He just told the nuns he could work on a project for them a few years ago. I've been here ever since. <laughs> Visitors to the Mount Carmel Monastery can come to the chapel, museum, and gift shop or enjoy the peaceful spaces outside. But Bill's work also takes him through to the other side of the wall, a place off limits to the rest of the world, giving him a rare glimpse into life inside this sacred enclosed space. So the sisters are truly in love with Jesus in a way that I'd never witnessed. Of course, when you're in love, you're happy. And so the sisters are, 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 are the happiest women I've ever met in my life. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks Don't let the bars me. of this Thank cloister you. fool you. So sometimes people look at it and they think, oh, they're in prison. The divide symbolizes the nuns are set apart for union with God. Reverend Mother Maria Bernardina, the prioress here, says the women in this cloister aren't held back from enjoying a profound, joyful freedom. It's a deep down happiness when you're doing God's will. Then you're free. You don't have to be in the cloister to be free. But for us, it's, that's our calling. And so we're saying yes to God, we're living our life fully, and we're free. And the location is significant. They live out their calling at Mount Carmel in Port Tobacco, Maryland, the first monastery for religious women in the U.S. founded in 1790. These nuns make up a small part of a global community of religious men and women called Carmelites. And the order's story in the U.S. starts here. The sisters who founded this monastery planted their Carmelite spirituality on this holy ground and it continues to thrive today. I love so much being so close uh, to the church, to the Blessed Sacrament. You know, we spend so much time a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. It's like the first person I see in the morning is the Lord in the tabernacle. It's the best thing. Sister Dolores Peter of Jesus Crucified in the Precious Blood began her formation with the Carmelites in Port Tobacco seven years ago. She's nearing her profession of final vows. I just can't imagine even wanting anything else, to be honest. Sister's journey here began in part when she started to learn more about the brown scapular. It can be worn by lay Catholics as a sign of faith and it has special significance for Carmelites. According to tradition, the history of the scapular goes back to July 16, 1251, when the Blessed Virgin Mary presented it to a Carmelite saint as a sign of her protection. Mother Virginia Marie O'Connor says it's not a good luck charm, it's a symbol of devotion to Jesus through Mary. To wear it, it means you pledge yourself to her and to what she stands for, you pledge yourself to Christ. Under the title Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Mary is the patroness of all Carmelites. It's her order, and we want to imitate her and her love for Jesus. She was the perfect mother. She was totally open to what God wanted. And that's what we want. We want to imitate Mary. We want to draw closer to Jesus in our daily life. Friendship with Christ, that's it's, uh, what prayer is. Our life is a love affair with God, mm -hmm. you know, with Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Carmelites live in community and have time for work and recreation, but the main focus of their lives is prayer for the good of the church and the world. Our vocation is prayer. And people say, well, yeah, but what do you do? I say, well, we, we pray. I was like, well, yeah, but, but what do you do? I was like, <laughs> their lives are given for others. Among those who left a worldly life to enter the Carmelite order have been some famous saints, including St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Therese of Lisieux, and St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, who said, Those who join the Carmelite order are not lost to their near and dear ones, but have been one for them, because it is our vocation to intercede to God for everyone. At Mount Carmel, a simple, prayerful, sacrificial life of faith is practiced in the cloister, but it can also be lived outside the walls. Carmelite spirituality is, I think, something that the world badly needs today. There's so much, so much clutter, so much distraction in the world. John Coleman has learned a lot from the Carmelites. He's come to daily mass at the monastery chapel for years. His own prayer life has grown seeing the nuns' commitment. They're committed to prayer. I, I believe that uh, prayer is so essential as uh, 
nowhere near enough prayer these days. Uh, I think we had more prayer, we'd have a lot less problems in this world. When I come here, um, I feel at peace and um, I feel closer to God, quite honestly. Kathleen Christensen is a wife and grandmother from Florida. She visits Mount Carmel each summer. Kathleen is a secular Carmelite, meaning she's made vows to take her own faith more seriously within her day-to-day -day life. The Carmelite um, spirituality is one of prayer, devotion, um, contemplation, and I knew that that was missing in my life. It was just something I felt. Carpenter Bill Hoxie wasn't sure what was missing from his own life, but he found it when he started working here for the sisters a few years ago. Not long after, he converted to Catholicism. <laughs> These nuns have shown Bill what it means to have complete trust in Jesus. He will lead you to something better than you could imagine. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. A beautiful story and an invitation to find similar joy in your prayer life. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us again next week when we present an entire program focused on the U.S. Catholic Church's National Eucharistic Revival. We share information, answer questions, and tell you how you can be involved. We hope to see you then.